Seven. The number seven. This number holds a peculiar fascination for people around the world, especially in the West. Many consider seven to be a lucky number. Some even think of it as a divine number. We make lists of seven. The seven wonders of the ancient world, the seven deadly sins, the seven virtues and seven vices. But why seven? I'm sure you could come up with three more amazing ancient achievements and have a list of the ten wonders of the ancient world. Or you could think of a few more examples of human wickedness and have nine deadly sins. So why do we settle on lists of seven things? Seven is deeply embedded into a conceptual structure nearly every human on the planet is familiar with, the seven-day week. But why would we have invented such an odd manner of measuring time? You may assume that it was enshrined in the creation story in the book of Genesis in the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible. God creates the world in six days and then rests on the seventh, establishing our week. But surprising to many, the ancient Hebrews were not the first to follow a seven-day week, nor were they the creators of it. It was actually the ancient Babylonians who invented the week as we know it now. It was adopted by the Hebrews during the period of Babylonian captivity, when a portion of the Hebrew population was deported back to Babylon after the conquest of Jerusalem. It was during this time, in the 6th century BCE, that the oral traditions of ancient Judaism became the written text of the Hebrew Bible. In writing outside the walls of Babylon, many elements of the conqueror's culture found their way into the Jewish writings, like elements of the flood story and bits of Babylonian law codes. In the seven-day week traveled those same routes, into the Bible and eventually into Western, now global, civilization. But why? Why would any ancient culture decide that seven days is a logical or desirable structure with which to measure the passage of time? It isn't mathematically convenient. It doesn't divide evenly into the number of days in a month or a year, which is why your birthday is on a different day of the week every year. It doesn't correspond to the number of fingers we have, which gave us our base 10 counting system. Wouldn't it make more sense to have a 10-day week? Or better yet, a 5-day week? We could count it on one hand and we get to the weekend sooner. But no, we have seven days. There must have been some really compelling reason the ancient Babylonians decided that this was a good thing. So forget what you think you know about the creation of the world in seven days and think about the question fresh. Why? Would any ancient civilization create this structure? How does it make sense? The other ways of measuring large spans of time are obvious, and they're built into the universe around us. We measure days, the passing of a cycle of light and darkness. We now know it is the time of one revolution of the planet we are on. We measure months, moons, really. It is the rough measure of one cycle of the phases of the moon, which is actually 29.53 days long, hence the need to jigger the number of days in a month to keep it in sync. And we measure years, a cycle of the seasons, which we now realize is due to the tilt of the Earth's axis as it rotates in orbit around the Sun. So, days, months, and years measure terrestrial, lunar, and solar cycles. They are built into the world around us. It is obvious that we would get into the habit of tracking time in this way. But what about the seven-day week? What is there built into the universe that would suggest the importance of the number seven? What are there only seven of? Seven continents? The ancients didn't know about the Americas, Australia, and Antarctica. Is Europe really its own continent? I mean, it just seems like the western butt end of Eurasia on a map. And besides, medieval scholars drew maps that featured three continents, called TO maps for the shape that they assume, which delineated Europe, Asia, and Africa, and so that doesn't work at all as an explanation. Seven seas? Well, there's really a lot more than seven seas. That is another of those conventions of lists of seven people make, to sail the seven seas. If you've studied music, you may know that there are seven tones in ancient Greek musical scales, or modes, as they called them. Today, we still count A, B, C, D, E, F, G on a piano. There's no key of H. After seven letters, we start over at the next octave. But that is just as artificial an invention as the seven-day week. You can divide the continuum of pitch in a musical scale in as many places as you like. In fact, modern music theory actually recognizes a division into 12 tones, once you count the five semitones, the black keys on the piano in each octave. When you listen to non-Western music, the music of India, China, or Japan, it sounds strange to our ears because it is built on different musical division of tones. That's why you can't play traditional Chinese music on a piano or a guitar. 
You must use their musical instruments designed to play the musical structures of their system. But interestingly, it turns out that the Western preference for a seven-tone scale is due to the very same reason we have a preference for a seven-day week. So, seven what? It is less obvious than the reasons for days, months, and years, but it is something one can notice if one is very patient and has begun the systematic study of the world around them and spends a lot of time looking upward, mostly at night. If you live in a big city like I do, then on a clear night you look up and see several dozen stars. But the ancients, living before modern light pollution, saw thousands of stars, a whole canopy of celestial lights shimmering overhead. And among those thousands of lights, the earliest stargazers in Babylon noticed that a few of them were special. They weren't necessarily brighter than the others, and they weren't part of significant constellations. In fact, the thing that made certain celestial lights different was that they wandered across the backdrop of stars, and each night were found in a different location, as measured against the fixed stars. All of the other lights, the stars, kept their same relative position as they moved in unison across the sky. The stars of the Big Dipper are always in the same position. They never rearrange into something else. And we can count on those three stars of Orion's belt to always be in the same configuration. But certain lights were wanderers. They were not attached to the stars behind them, nor were they attached to each other, nor were they in geosynchronous orbit around the Earth. These were the visible planets, a word which in Greek means wanderer. And how many planets can you see without a telescope? Well, only five actually. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn are all visible to the naked eye. But add the sun and the moon, two big lights that also have their own unique paths across the sky, and that makes seven. Today we differentiate between the planets, the moon, Earth satellite, and the sun, the star we all revolve around. But for the ancients, these were all planets, the wandering lights in the sky. The Babylonians were some of the world's first great astronomers, and they may have been the very first to discover that there were seven special lights in the sky, existing between the Earth and the distant stars, wandering independently on their own unique paths, as if under their own intelligent direction. These were the seven heavenly bodies. And if you lived in the ancient world, a world saturated by myth and mysticism, even as science and mathematics were emerging, then what would you assume these special, intelligent lights were? They must be gods. The Babylonian astronomers, who were themselves priests, as most ancient educated stargazers were, decided that there were seven major deities looking down upon them, and such gods required worship. It was they who invented the system of having a special day of worship devoted to each of these seven gods, and after all seven had been appropriately venerated to start the cycle over again. The seven-day week was born, which, because of its adoption by the Hebrews, would eventually find its way into all of Western civilization. There is no evidence that the pre-conquest Hebrews followed a seven-day week, or even had a creation story featuring seven days. And why would they? Until one becomes devoted to astronomy, there is no reason to believe that the number seven is special. The ancient Hebrews were shepherds and warriors, but not astronomers. In all of the Old Testament, only one planet is mentioned, Venus, and it is called the Morning Star, by people who had not yet discovered the difference between stars and planets. Meanwhile, around the time that the Hebrews in exile were finalizing the written Bible, the Greek philosopher and mystic Pythagoras, you all memorized a famous theorem with his name attached to it, who was an avid researcher into mathematics, music, and astronomy, was noticing the same thing about the planets as the Babylonians had. In fact, it was Pythagoras who coined the term planets to describe them. He was also the first of the Greek philosophers to teach that the world is round, something educated people in the West have known ever since. So forget about that myth of Columbus thinking he might sail off the edge of the world. Columbus had gone to school and knew what every schoolboy of ancient and medieval times knew. The world was round. Anyway, Pythagoras did not think of the planets as literally gods, but rather as divine intelligences that structured the universe with geometrical harmony and beauty. And being as devoted to the study of music as he was astronomy, it was Pythagoras who divided the scale into those seven tones, one for each heavenly body, and believed that if one could fly up to the heavens, one would hear a celestial symphony, each planet sounding one of the tones of the musical scale, 
the harmony of the spheres, an aesthetic notion that would also have a long history in Western arts. Once the idea of seven became commonly accepted as a number of divinity, all sorts of applications emerged in literature and in belief systems. All of those lists of seven began to emerge, and in much ancient literature, one encounters the number seven showing up for no particularly compelling reason other than that it is a special number. In the ancient epic of Gilgamesh, the wild man Ankidu is brought into civilization after having recreational sex with a harlot for seven nights, after which he drinks seven goblets of beer, leading him to realize how attractive city life might be. In the Babylonian version of the flood story, the flood hero Utnapishtim builds a boat with seven decks, and it rains for seven days. The whole story takes place in multiples of seven. Whenever you find seven showing up like this in the literature of antiquity, it is always an indicator that the culture has developed astronomy and taken notice of the seven heavenly bodies. Still today, the names of those seven days in the week are attached to the planets which inspired them. The Babylonians used the names of their own gods, as did the Greeks, but we've inherited names that derive from the Roman version of these ancient deities. Not all will be familiar to English speakers, but for those who know a Romance language, like Spanish or French, the languages descended from the Roman language of Latin, then the names of the days of the week still reflect the names of the planets. We have the day of the sun, or Sunday, which most Romance languages render as the day one goes to church and prays to the Lord, the Dominus in Latin, hence Domingo in Spanish and Dimanche in French. The moon, or moon day, Monday in English, in the lunar day, lunis in Spanish, in lundi in French. Tuesday is the day of Mars. We'll have to leave English for a bit, but it is still recognizably martes in Spanish and mardi in French. The day of Mercury, which gives us miércoles in Spanish and mercredi in French. The day of Jupiter, who is also called Jove, which gives us jueves in Spanish and judi in French. The day of Venus, which gives us viernes in Spanish and vendredi in French. Then finally the day of Saturn, Saturday in English, but sabado in Spanish and samedi in French, which refer to the fact that Saturday is the original day of the Sabbath in the Old Testament. We still call the names of the days of the week by the ancient pagan deities associated with the planets, as they were known to Babylonians, Greeks, and Romans. As for the four days during the week that in English no longer match the Roman planetary gods, this is because of the process of syncretism, or religious blending, that occurred when Christianity moved north from the ancient Mediterranean into the medieval north of Europe. The new religion couldn't just eradicate all the local customs and religious cults at once. Conversion happens by slow integration of local elements into the new dominant religious culture. And when similar gods were found to be worshipped by the locals as the ancient Roman pagans had had, that was a place where blending could happen. Thus the day of Mars, the god of war, was replaced with the name of a Germanic war god named Tyr. The day of Mercury, a god most know as the messenger of Zeus, but was also a venerated deity of cleverness and quick wits in his own right, found a parallel in the wise Norse god Odin, or Woden, or Wotan. Jupiter, Zeus to the Greeks, whose weapon of choice was the lightning bolt, found an easy parallel in Thor, the god of thunder. And while the Romans had a fertility goddess named Venus, Aphrodite to the Greeks, the northern Europeans had a fertility goddess named Frigg, or Freya. Thus today, English, which is a Germanic language in origin, has a Tuesday, Wotan's Day, Thor's Day, and Freya's Day. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. You'll find similar names in German, although at some point the name of Wotan's Day was eliminated, probably an attempt to lessen the influence of the Allfather in the minds of newly converted Germanic tribesmen, and today it is merely known as Midwoch, Midweek. And one curious final bit. In the early Middle Ages, there was a Christian bishop who thought that calling the days of the week after pagan gods was just too, well, pagan. And he started a movement to change all the name days and merely number them. His sphere of influence corresponded to modern day Portugal. And thus in the Portuguese language, none of the days have names, but are called Domingo, still the day of the Lord, followed by Segunda, Terca, Corta, and so on. Merely numbered until Saturday. Once again, Sabado, the Sabbath. There's one final wrinkle to all this. How did the days of the week get each planetary deity assigned, and why are they in a different order than the ancients understood the planets to be in? 
By ancient reckoning, when you look into the sky and assume the Earth that you are standing on is the center of everything, then the order of the planets appears to be thus. Earth, followed by the Moon, obviously the closest thing to us, then Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. It is actually pretty darn impressive that ancient stargazers, without the benefit of a telescope or modern computer simulations, figured out the order of the planets as accurately as they did. Just transpose the Earth and the Sun, carrying our Moon along with it, and everything is in the correct order as we understand it uh, in a modern heliocentric system. But this order is not the order of the names assigned to the days of the week. And this is because the Romans, who adopted not only this Babylonian Greek system, but also a solar calendar and a 24-hour day from the Egyptians, blended the two systems together in the Julian calendar giving not only a day of worship devoted to each planetary deity, but also each hour of each day to one, with the order repeating after seven hours had passed. Thus, for example, the day of Sunday would begin with the hour of the sun, followed by the day of the sun, the hour of the moon, etc. The 24 hours are thus subdivided into seven three times, with three left over. Then the next planet in the system becomes the venerated body of the first hour of the next day which in this case would be the hour of the moon, which then gives its name to the whole day. While seven doesn't divide evenly into too many things, it does work out here. As you go through the pattern of the planets three times, then three more steps, then landing on the next day, you get through all seven planets in seven days and the entire system starts over. This did the order of the planets, as understood by ancient geocentric astronomy, get rearranged into the order we still see reflected in the names of the days of the week. And there you have it. Woven into your everyday life are the names of pagan deities and a very ancient Babylonian tradition. Equal parts mythology and astronomy, mathematics and mysticism. Filtered through the triumphant Romans with some Egyptian borrowings and bequeathed in various forms to Western civilization. And resonating through it all is the mystical reverence for the number seven. Our special lucky number which most people have positive feelings for, although most have no idea why. Look around your world, and when you find mystical references to seven, remember the ancient Babylonian stargazers whose scientific mythological musings some 4,000 years ago still shape your world.